Welcome to the December 5, 2008 edition of the Open Forum. How wonderful it is that again we have an evening when we can spend uh, the next hour and a half looking into the Word of God, trying to understand what is true, what really uh, is God teaching us in His Word, and how wonderful we can know that we're using a book that has been written by God Himself, and therefore it is absolutely true and trustworthy. But we have instruction in the Bible how to do this. We have to compare Scripture with Scripture. We don't try to relate the Bible to some current event, some uh, great event in what's happening in some nation of the world, and try the two together, try to tie the two together, and thus find truth. That isn't the way it goes. We have to look only in the Word of God. But this is your program. We want to hear from you. So shall we take our first call tonight, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hi. Good evening, Brother Camden. Yes. I have a question about the Bible. I was wondering, where does it say in the Bible that dreams and visions come from the devil? Drinking comes from the devil? No, dreams and or visions. Oh, dreams or visions. Well, it, it, it doesn't say it directly, but it says in in uh, uh, Revelation 22, verse 18, that's almost at the very end of the Bible, God says, if anyone adds to the... Uh, uh, to the... Uh, to, uh, to this book... I will add to him the plagues written herein. In other words, uh, God is telling us that there's no more direct revelation coming from God. God has given it to us in his word, the Bible. And now those who uh, are thinking that they had a beautiful vision uh, and God spoke to them, Effectively, they are saying, we know something God doesn't know. And that is, God is still speaking to us today through that vision or through that dream. And that's impossible. And uh, it, it, where did it come from? If it really was a supernatural thing that happened, and it can be supernatural, then it had to come from uh, Satan, who comes in the secular world, uh, through tarot cards and through Ouija boards and uh, seances and so on. Uh, and if he is able to break the silence between the, the uh, uh, natural and the supernatural here in the secular world, you can rest assured he's going to plague those who claim to be believers. So we want to stay away from that altogether. But well, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. <clears throat> Welcome. I mean, how you doing, Mr. Kevin? Yes, uh, my, my question is this. Uh, I, I was married 18 years, and now I'm divorced. I know what the Bible says, but at the same time, would I be wrong to get married again? And I take your question on the air. Is you wrong to marry again? Now, why would you want to deliberately disobey God when God says what God has joined together let not man put asunder and a wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives and uh, so uh, you, if your former wife is still living you, know, you cannot you, we're not to, you're not to marry again uh, the Bible says uh, that if someone is well let, let's look at Luke chapter 16, for example, where we read in Luke 16, uh, who's, verse 18, Whosoever putteth away his wife and marries another commits adultery, and whosoever marries her that is put away from her husband commits adultery. And adultery is sin. So why would you want to deliberately go into sin 
when st the wages of sin is death. You can't take a more terrible path to walk. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Mr. Campy? Yes. I have a question. Um, I've been wondering, what are, are we supposed to protect the people in Israel because those are God's chosen people? Uh, the, when God talks about his people, right. he is not talking about national Israel. Now, that was true until uh, Christ came. The, the God uh, was declaring a gospel through the nation of Israel. But when he, when he shifted to the church age, then, uh, then he began to share the gospel through the churches that were, that were uh, designed or that were constructed all over the world uh, as, as a divine organization through which God was bringing the gospel. And, and uh, in the nation of Israel is just another nation. It's, just no, it's no different than being a Filipino or a Chinese or a uh, Portuguese or anything else. They're just another nation. Uh, now, God's people are the true believers, are the true believers. And we don't know who they are. We don't know who the true believers are. So uh, we, uh, the Bible simply says, love your enemies. And our enemies is anybody in the world, whether they are saved or non-saved. All we know is, is that uh, we are to love everyone, and we're not to hard touch. We're not to harm anybody. I understand that, but why are the churches putting so much emphasis on Israel? We're supposed to protect. Because they misunderstand the Bible altogether. They do not understand a fundamental principle that God lays down, namely that Christ spoke in parables. When they see the word Israel, immediately they think of blood descendants of Abraham. When we realize that Christ spoke in, it, in parables, when we see the word Israel, we think of those who are, are, are God's people. And, and there's very few in, nation, in the nation of Israel who are God's people, although there is, although there is a tiny remnant. But, but they're found in every nation of the world. So they read the Bible, these other churches, and they read the Bible, they see the word Israel, and immediately that's all they think about is the uh, blood descendant of Abraham, and that's just not true at all. See, God, <coughs> Jesus came through the Holy Spirit, so there was really no bloodline. I'm sorry? I said Jesus came through the Holy Spirit... So there was no bloodline. Well, uh, the, the only bloodline, you know, here, let me read from Galatians chapter 3. This will. Uh, God talks about Abraham's seed. Abraham's seed. Christ is the seed of Abraham. And he says in Galatians 3, verse... Uh, oh, I'm in the wrong chapter. In verse um, verse 29, if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now, they're Abraham's seed, they are the Jews. But here it's saying, if ye be Christ, that, that means whether you're Jew or Gentile, then you are Abraham's seed. God is defining who he looks upon as a Jew. That's Galatians chapter 3, verse 29. And thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Brother Camping. Yes. I read your book, We Are Almost There. 
Now, my question to you is this. You have certain numbers in there that you times two, times three, times three. Okay, my concern is with you say 43 or 37 is God's wrath. How do you come to that summation that 37 is God's wrath? I also have oh, a second question, well, but answer the first one. This one. The, the, we see how God uses numbers. Numbers are... Uh, you remember Christ spoke in parables. He can use the number 1,000, for example, to be a literal number, or it can also be symbolic in, in indicating the completeness of God's plan. The number 3 it, it, it can be a literal number, but we, the way God uses it, it in many parts of the Bible, it is it, it, uh, spiritually is indicating the purpose of God. Now, 37, it's interesting that God made a point that the flood waters encompassed the earth for 370 days. That's 10 times 37. And the flood waters were there to destroy the earth. It's interesting that there were 185,000 soldiers of Sennacherib, a, a Syrian uh, king, or, or captain that were destroyed in one night during the days I believe of Hezekiah uh, when we divide 185 or uh, break it down we find that it is 5 times 10 times 37 again we find that number 37 identified with destruction so and these are both very very uh, pertinent places that is they're very much involved with destruction so we feel rather safe to look upon 37 as signifying destruction now when you when you went through the book we're almost there there's a lot of information that's all laid out and it's it's not absolutely conclusive until until we see the proofs. If, for example, in developing the timeline of history all the way from the beginning and the significance of these numbers and so on, we were in error, and we could easily be in error, then when we finally got to the end and where, where, where all of this landed us, we would have, uh, uh, have had to say, well, uh, it, this is all very probable, very possible. Uh, we think we've done a pretty good job in understanding the Bible. But we, could, we wouldn't dare say, absolutely, we know that we have done a, a correct job. But when we came to the end of that study and we saw the proofs like, uh, a day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day. And uh, the, the number uh, uh, that uh, factored into 5 times 10 times 17 times 5 times 10 times 17, the exact number of days from the time of the cross until the day of the rapture uh, 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 it could not be coincidental. And other proofs uh, that, uh, that showed up, we are assured by the Bible, by the Bible, that all of this information that has been put together from the Bible has been put together correctly, correctly. Because otherwise, if there, if there, if if some, if part of the plan of of developing the timeline had been done incorrectly then we would not have ended right where we did on all the dates of, uh, for example, the date of the rapture and the date of the uh, end of the church of the uh, day of judgment and the date of uh, mm, the end of the church age and so on. Uh, but uh, the proofs show us that God had guided us very accurately. And so that is why, I, as a teacher, I had no option except to say, I know we've done our work correctly. We have the proofs. If we 
if we don't listen to the proofs, then we're not listening to the Bible at all. And the Bible is showing us that God has indeed guided us accurately. Camping? Yeah. My second question to you is this, and I need some clarification on this. You always say that under no circumstance can a person get divorced. Now, if you look at the Scripture, it clearly states that Jesus says, only in the case of adultery. It states it right there in the Scripture. Now, can you clarify that for me? Because well, Jesus yeah. is speaking now. He says in the case of adultery, you can get a divorce. Well, excuse me. Uh, uh, that uh, When we look at Matthew 19, verse 9, that is what a conclusion that we could easily come to. But remember, the biblical rule is you don't... Uh, you uh, take uh, or accept your conclusion until you test it against the rest of the Bible or the rest of the Bible and uh, right there in that context God is Christ is saying he's giving us the law what God has joined together let not man put asunder then he uh, he reinforces that back in uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 39, where he says, The wife is bound to by the law to her husband as long as he lives. Those, those, are, those are things have to be factored in. Well, then we go back to the setting of Matthew 19, and we find earlier on in verse 3 that the Jews came to him, testing him, trying to trap him, and saying, can you divorce for every cause? And Jesus' answer was, no. You, uh, what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. Then they reminded Jesus of the law that was stipulated, uh, that was laid out in Deuteronomy 24, verse 1, where it says, if a man found some uncleanness in his wife, he could write a bill of divorcement and put her away. Uh, and they said, what about that? And look at Jesus' answer. God gave that law because of the hardness of your heart. Now, what did he mean by that? Well, you see, in the Old Testament, when we search this out, we find that God had spiritually become married to ancient Israel. And every, but every time they sinned, they were engaging in spiritual fornication or spiritual adultery. And according to the law that God had first put in the book of Deuteronomy, I think it's in Deuteronomy 22, if a man found his wife in adultery, he was to stone her to death, put her to death. But Christ could not do that with national Israel because Christ had to come out of national Israel, and he had other purposes for national Israel. Therefore, in Deuteronomy 24, 24 verse 1, he set up a temporary substitute law. Now, God is the lawgiver. He can write the law. And so he said, if a man found some uncleanness, indicating uh, that uh, the uncleanness, uh, from other passages we know has to be fornication so then he returns in Matthew 19 to their original question can a man put away his wife for every cause and then in verse 9 he says uh, if not for fornication we've already covered that that was a temporary law and now I've rescinded it I've said what God has joined together let not man put asunder that no longer stands uh, fact is the uh, when the the uh, when the uh, uh, at the time of Christ is when that divorce from national Israel became final, so that uh, uh, so that Christ be could become married to the true believers. He became the bride, uh, uh, or we become the bride of Christ as the bridegroom. And so he says. Uh, we've covered the matter of divorce, if not uh, of adultery, if not for adultery, for any other reason, he goes on to say there's not to be divorce. Now, you see, this is a very complex answer to a simple question. 
But that's the way God wrote the Bible. And, and all kinds of people read a verse, and as the verse stands, they can conclude that they know what God's will is. Like, if you want to become saved, believe on the Lord Jesus. As it stands, it seems so simple and so direct. What, what, how, could, uh, how could it be misunderstood? And yet, if you tried to become saved by believing on the Lord Jesus, uh, we, uh, you would be absolutely guaranteed to end up under the wrath of God because you are violating other laws in the Bible that have to also be taken into account. But thank, thank you, Brother Camping. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, Mr. Camping? Yeah. Yes, good evening. Uh, thanks for taking my call. Um, I have a question. Uh, with everything happening in the world today, yes. uh, the sign, signs of times and all the natural disasters and the corruptness in people's lives, uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, does this current economic crisis that we're experiencing uh, have anything to do with uh, the end time? I know, I know nothing in the Bible that could relate to this current economic crisis any more than anything in the Bible that relates to uh, the, our war with Iraq or, uh, or the t tension that exists between Iraq and Iran and national Israel. And none of these things are found anywhere in the Bible. The, the now what about in Revelations where it talks about... Uh, uh, buying and selling with, uh, if you have the mark, you can buy and sell, and if you don't uh, have that mark, uh, you know. Uh, Remember first... that Christ spoke in parables, and the God uses the idea of merchandising in sending forth the gospel. Remember Isaiah 55, it's the call of the merchant. Ho, oh, everyone that thirsteth, come buy wine and milk without money and without price, and so on. It's the call of the merchant. God uses the picture of the ships of Tarshish that went out and returned every three years with gold and silver and other things. And that, again, was spiritually indicating the sending forth of the gospel and bringing back those, bringing into the kingdom of God those whom God planned to save. And uh, it's uh, so to buy or sell is a figure that is pointing to the sending forth of the gospel. Now you read about that in Revelation 13, and it's an ominous and terrible thing that is said there, and yet it's absolutely true. No man could buy or sell unless they had the mark of the beast. That is, unless they are owned by Satan. You see, when th that passage of Revelation 13 is speaking about the, the time we're living in right now, the time of great tribulation, when Satan has been installed to rule in the congregation. He's typified there in Revelation 13 as a beast that comes out of the earth. And he has uh, horns like a lamb, and yet he spoke as a dragon. And uh, that is Satan as he, as he comes as an angel of light in the churches. And, and during this great tribulation, the churches have thrown out anybody who is really a true believer. Because they... Uh, they uh, are coming with a different kind of a gospel. They're coming with a gospel that's insisting uh, what we have believed in this church is not correct at all. And so they're thrown out. And the only ones that are allowed to buy or sell, the only ones who are allowed uh, to share the gospel in the churches are those who have their own kind of a gospel one that is not true to the Word of God. I like I uh, use the illustration of starting out with uh, an idea of, or telling people that as long as you, if you believe on the Lord Jesus, you will become saved. That is absolutely false. 
and yet that is taught in every congregation. That's part of salvation, though, believing. And there's also repenting, confessing. Salvation uh, is a work that God has done entirely. Christ, uh, Christ made the full payment for the sins of those he came to save before he ever created the world. And all that is left now is that at some point in the life of the one who is elected to salvation, God must apply that word to that person's heart. And uh, he can do that as that person, if that person is a little baby, or he can wait until he's middle-aged, or he can wait till an hour before he dies. But uh, he has to give that person a brand new resurrected soul, an eternal soul, because he had made the full payment for his sins long before creation. And therefore, there's no way that that person could ever come under the wrath of God. Now, God does set up a environment in which this happens. Faith cometh, that is, Christ is the very essence of faith. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And that is why God wants us to get everybody possible to start listening to the Word of God. That puts the them in an environment where God will complete his salvation and God will see to it that the right ones come into that environment with the doesn't leave that to man at all you'll see to it that they do come in that right environment and then in God's own time he, and as they uh, and one of the one of the uh, uh, situations that develop when we're in the environment of the Bible is that we we want to turn from our sins. We want to do it God's way, even though we know that we're under the wrath of God. And so or the best we can do is, and it won't guarantee salvation at all, but this is what or what is pleasing to God, certainly, as he uses the illustration of the publican in Luke 18, I, uh, God, have mercy on me. I am a sinner. And so we can plead for mercy, but we always have to recognize we don't deserve salvation. We deserve the wrath of God. But yet, maybe, because God is a merciful God, He might have mercy on me too. But thank you. We have to pause for this message. We're continuing with the Open Forum, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Harold. It's good to have you back. I have a question about uh, Passover Friday in A.D. 33. Uh, you have allotted a date by the Julian calendar of April 1, and I agree with that. I've mathematically, uh, I'm, I'm satisfied with that mathematically. But there are some calendars uh, on the Internet that show that Friday as April the 3rd. And I'm wondering how we can deal with that. Well, I don't... Uh, you mean uh, uh, April... They're showing the Friday of Passover in A.D. 33, and they're giving it a date of April the 3rd. And, and I think that uh, might be confusing. Well, the, the problem is I don't recall uh, whether... What my conclusion was, it, uh, uh, I, I, I show it in... Uh, we're almost there, but I don't remember whether it was April 2nd or April 3rd or April 1st. I, I just don't recall my, uh, that from memory. Uh, so uh, so uh, you're talking about something I, I really can't get into. Well, you do say it's April the 1st, oh, and, April. I, and I agree with that. Oh, okay, if it is April 1, then it... Uh, uh, however, somebody else worked that out. I have no idea, but I do know this: that whatever um, uh, the final conclusion, and, and there was a time when I was a day different. And but after working on that and working on that uh, every which way possible, and double checking and triple checking, uh, I am very certain I have given the right date. Now I can't speak for anybody else. Uh, you know, they might start calculating from uh, a 
a Jewish calendar, and in a Jewish calendar, uh, they they have made certain rules that are not found in the Bible, but uh, for, in the Jewish religion, they have made certain rules that that sometimes a date might be one day or two days different than it would have been if we just strictly followed the Bible. So, but I can't speak for them at all. To get to that date. I'm sorry? Do you use a mathematical method oh, of reviving oh, at that date? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. But it's, uh, it's, it's, been, uh, it's been checked and double-checked, not only by myself, but by others, that we are absolutely... That, that is a... Uh, I, I want uh, that, that really is a, a starting point for all the dates of the Bible, and uh, so I had to get that absolutely accurate, and I'm very, very confident that we've got that right. And again, <laughs> and see, this is, this is the, the, the beauty of this whole thing. When we came to all the proofs, as we lay them out in the uh, as we got them from the Bible of of all the dates, uh, and that they're all those dates are tied to April one as the Passover date of uh, of uh, A.D. thirty three, and and if it if it were any other date, then all these other dates would be different, then the proofs wouldn't work out. So I I I I, 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 I if you I, you tell me that. That it's April one, I don't recall that for for sure. But if it is, if it's in the book, we're almost there as April one. It's April one. Yeah, and I have checked that, and I believe you're right. All right. Well, then I can't speak for anybody else. I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Yes. Uh, I've been listening to your program for some time now, and I'm still confused about what happens to people when they die before the end time. For example, uh, earlier this summer, you may recall, earlier this year, there was a large ferry ship in the Philippines that capsized, and over 700 people drowned, uh, including a lot of women and children. And uh, one of the survivors said when the boat was going over and it was pitching into darkness and filling up with water, People were crying out to Jesus to save them because these are true believers. These were not like sinners or non-believers. These people really loved and believed in Jesus, but God let the boat capsize. God let all these people, including little women and children, just drown. Well, uh, excuse me. It's very, very uh, clear from the scriptures. They are, uh, either you die saved or not saved. There's nothing in between. If you, excuse me. If you die saved, it means that you only your body dies. Your soul, which is an integral part of your personality, does not die. It leaves the body at that instant and goes to live and reign with Christ in heaven temporarily until the day of the rapture when... Uh, your body will be resurrected, a glorified spiritual body, and joined again with your eternal soul. Now, that if there was any true believer, we have no idea if there was, but but if there were any true believers on when that craft sank, uh, they their souls would uh, have not died. But on the other hand, most people in the world are not saved. And uh, maybe uh, uh, the, the, the most uh, certainly most people on that craft probably were not saved, and they simply die, body and soul. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The wages of sin is death. They're done. They're dead. There's no more remembrance that they'll ever have. They'll never have conscious existence again. It's true. On the day of the rapture, the day of the judgment day begins, their bodies, if if they were put in a grave somewhere, will be thrown out and uh, to be shamed in the eyes of God uh, and uh, as a final... Uh, 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 as, as a part of the final activity 
of God's judgment on people, but the people themselves will never know about it. They're, they simply died. They're, they're, they're dead. They're, they no longer will ever have any conscious existence. Just like when an animal dies, it's dead. But thank you for calling and sharing. And, you know, that's a blessing of God because these people, of course, have, uh, that, are, that are not saved have really uh, uh, been punished very severely, but they don't know about it. The punishment that they've received is the shame uh, before God, which is a terrible shame, the fact that they will not live eternally with the Lord Jesus Christ, they will not be inheritors of the new heaven and the new earth, and these are magnificent blessings that potentially could come to any human being because we were created in the image of God at the beginning. and But because of our sin, we lose that. But the typical person uh, who dies unsaved doesn't even know about that or, or uh, certainly uh, is not thinking very much about that. He, he, the, the, what he's lost uh, is that he can't live his life anymore out in this world and he is physically dead. And, and that's a blessing uh, because uh, you know, those who are alive at the time that, that the judgment day begins, they are going to experience, uh, many of them will experience the wrath of God and know that they're under the wrath of God because they have not listened to the final warning that May 21, 2011 is the day when Christ will end it all. Just like uh, when, uh, 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 just like it was told the people in Noah's day, the exact time when the destruction would occur. And in the days of Nineveh, or in the book of Jonah, those people were given the exact time of the impending destruction. But they repented and cried to God for mercy, all of them. And so God changed or was able to, to postpone that judgment. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, John 5.30. John 5, verse 30. John 5, verse 30. There we read, I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. Now, what is your question? What do we do with a verse like that when it's, you know, well, it's, it's, it, it, you see, this verse is, is emphasizing a principle, namely that while there are three persons in the Godhead, they do not operate independently. They are in perfect harmony with each other, perfect agreement. Uh, that has to be because God. Uh, uh, otherwise, there would be uh, uh, sin in the Godhead, and that's not possible. And so when he says, uh, I can do nothing as I hear, uh, I can of myself do nothing as I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father. Now, actually, the judgment process was set up that already the Word of God, and remember Christ is identified with the Word. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. But the Word of God, the very Bible itself, brings judgment. Uh, if uh, the, the, the day we disobey a law of God, that law will c condemn us. We're under that judgment, and that's all in total harmony with the whole Godhead. So, so when he's saying he can't do something, it's not that he can't do it. He's just he's I'm giving sorry. all the honor. It, I'm sorry. Repeat that. When he's saying like he can't do something, he's 
He's oh, given all the honor to the Father. Oh, it's not that he doesn't have the ability to. It's it's that he is there is perfect harmony. Remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, now Jesus had been given an awesome responsibility to demonstrate how he suffered in making payment for our sins, even though he's not doing it to make payment for sins. That was all done before he ever created the world. And yet he has to go through that terrible suffering again uh, just to demonstrate to uh, to uh, uh, the world as well as other principalities and powers that God may have created just how he suffered. And so he, he said, he prayed, Abba, Father, is it possible that this cup might pass from me? Yet not my will, but thine be done. In other words, well, it was a horror story par excellence that he had to face. He knew that whatever, uh, whatever uh, had been decreed, in the Godhead, he had to go through it. There could not be a change. Okay. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes, welcome to Open Forum. Thank you. Uh, this is uh, Barella from uh, Tahiki, New Mexico. And uh, I just uh, uh, tuned into your channel. I, I really love it. And... Uh, I had a just a, a real quick question on uh, on uh, on uh, I I, uh, I was reading the Bible and um, on um, it says uh, that there, the second Passover was on January the 14th for the for the unclean. I don't know if you recall that. Well, yes, if uh, it was in January, also, um, excuse me, it it was not our, our calendar. That's January is our calendar. It was the first month of the Jewish calendar, which came in the spring of the year, uh, right near the uh, so, the spring solstice. Uh, it it uh, would have been in March or April. But uh, if if they were unable uh, 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 to get all the preparation and so on for the 14th of the first month then they could have a Passover on, uh, postponed until the 14th day of the second month. And there was one time that that is recorded, that they actually did it that way. But yes. now, uh, now spiritually what that represents, I don't know. I have not uh, worked on that. Yes, sir. Well, uh, I appreciate it. And I, I, uh, I would ask for you to pray for me and my family, and, and uh, God bless you. And Thank have a good night. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, hello, Mr. Campy. Yes. Yes, good to hear from you. Um, we know that Christ did all the work of salvation, uh, uh, creation, everything. Uh, the work of repentance, as we read in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 18 and 19, the writer, which God, of course, is writing through him, says, When you turn me, then I repented. So we know that even repentance is all of God, and uh, that just goes to show you that there's uh, absolutely nothing we can do if we're dead in sins and trespasses unless Christ raises us from the spiritual dead by uh, hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ crucified. Um, when Jesus spoke to the Pharisees in John 5:39, he said, "You search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have, you know, salvation, but they are they that." Uh, speak of me uh, they were trying to keep the law and by the way you, you, you can't do it you can't keep the law perfectly and it's Christ that says in Romans 10 4 that uh, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to those that believe that are really saved so just trying to say repentance is even of Christ Jeremiah chapter I 31, think verse. that's a very very excellent reference let me read it Jeremiah 31 uh, verse 19 surely after that I was turned I repented, and after that I was instructed. Uh, I, I smote upon my thigh, I was ashamed, yea, even confounded, because I did bear the reproach of my youth. And uh, this is a, 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 a verse that we don't normally read, but it is emphasizing that the turning, the repenting, is because God has turned us, and he's done it by giving us 
a new resurrected soul. We cannot repent in a way that is pleasing to God until God applies the Word of God to our lives and gives us a brand new resurrected soul. Then we are a new creature in, in, in that we don't want to sin anymore. And that's when the repentance, the true repentance develops. Yes, uh, uh, very good. And also when it says in First John that if you're a sinner, you'll, you'll confess your sins. It, God, like it says in Ezekiel 36, after you have gotten a new heart and a new soul, then you'll loathe yourself for your sins. It's that we confess we're still sinners as we live out the rest of our life here in the flesh, not in the soul. And uh, yet we see the glory of God and give him the glory. It's all because of him. So uh, in, in the flesh I'm still a sinner, but in the soul I'm perfectly whole. And I just be patient, as it says in Revelation 14, and wait for Christ and the fulfillment of my uh, body and soul someday in heaven, and to him gets all the glory. And there's a lot of rest in that, knowing that uh, that I'm still a sinner in the flesh, but yet I'm, I'm righteous because Christ is my righteousness. There's a lot of peace and a lot of joy in knowing that, as it says in John 17:3. That's to know Christ as my righteousness. Boy, there's a lot of peace there. I'm not working at anything. Yeah, Christ well. did all the work. Yep. Thank you so much for sharing all of those uh, uh, thoughts. Uh, uh, it, it indicates the, the wondrous truths of the Bible. But thank you. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Brother Camping. Praise the Lord. I'm just excited just for the Lord to come back soon in 2011. And I wondered if there's any question that... Uh, I've been saved for 31 years, but can a person lose their salvation? Can a person lose? If they sin, if they sin against God or it can become lukewarm, can they lose their salvation? Well, now wait a minute. What is what? Uh, how many of the sins that we would ever commit <laughs> did Christ pay for when He saved us? Yeah. How many did He save? How many did He pay for? He paid for every one of them. And on top of that, if we're really saved, he gave us a, a new soul that we, in which we will, have, will live forevermore. And so, of course, we can't lose our salvation. But the kind of salvation that is offered in the churches, yes, you can lose that because it's not the salvation of the Bible. It's because people took an action themselves and therefore claimed that now they are saved, they accepted Christ or they believed on Christ and therefore now they know they're saved and, and they actually have had none of their sins paid for. So, of course, they're going to lose that. Love you, man. But that's that's a good and word. So when you say for yourself, for example, that you've been saved for years and years and years, Think it out very carefully. This is the time when if we're not, if we find out we're not saved, we can still cry to God for mercy. And maybe God will have mercy on us. Don't, don't. Uh, unfortunately, uh, what has been taught in the churches, and this is true in every congregation, is not the salvation program of the Bible. It's a salvation program that is dependent upon something that I must also do in order to achieve this. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Brother Camping. I have two questions for you. The first one might be kind of silly, but um, let's, let's say, for example, that I'm going to go out and buy a car, and we know that the end of the world is, uh, you know, about three years away and I decide to take a seven-year loan out. Would that be wrong? Well, I don't know. Uh, you, you know, when we start playing games with this business of the end of the world, we got to really begin to ask, am I serious about this matter of Judgment Day coming? You know, this matter of Judgment Day is is way more serious than buying a car. And, uh, and taking advantage of something. Uh, that, uh, it, what, what, what you want to do is, is, uh, 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 the people who are really going to escape the wrath of God are those who 
are, are walking hand in hand with the Lord Jesus, then their their whole whole focus is on their relationship with Him. But you pray for wisdom about anything of that nature. Uh, just pray for wisdom. I'm I, I'm not going to give any direction. Okay, I have a second question. Um, I'm not sure if I'm saved or not, but I feel like the Lord might be drawing me, and I happen to be dating a girl that is uh, doesn't really have a lot of interest, uh, you know, and and uh, you know the Bible and that kind of thing, and it's it's causing a lot of stress, obviously. And uh, any any words of advice, or just pray for some wisdom well, on that? Well, of course, the Bible says, "Don't be unequally yoked with an unbeliever." And if you are dating a girl who is... Why are you dating that girl? Why are you romancing that girl? Because it is uh, with the idea, maybe, maybe we can get married someday. And you know right now that... uh, Or you sense right now that she doesn't really uh, uh, think like a true believer would think that where this is really a, a big part of her life. And you think that you are a true believer? Well, then you are heading right into great trouble. You, because, you know, uh, love is very blind. People don't like to realize this, but love is very blind. And you can start dating somebody thinking, oh, well, I can break it off any time. And the next thing you become infatuated. And, uh, and the next thing uh, uh, you begin to make excuses. Well, yeah... I know she's not really... I don't think I should. But on the other hand, I, 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 you know, you begin to argue with yourself about it. You've been... You, you are being trapped. Trapped. And why go deeper into a trap? But thank uh, you th- for... Uh, thank you, Brother Camping. Uh, I love you very much, and thanks for all your uh, great work, okay? Bye thank now. you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hey. Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, I was camping. How are you today? Mr. Camping? Yes, go ahead with your call. Hi, I was camping. How are you today? Hi, I was camping. How are you today? Uh, oh, the Lord has been very good to me. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Um, uh, how do you get eternally saved by Christ? How do I get eternally saved? saved by crying out to Christ for his mercy. Oh, Lord, have mercy on me. I know I'm a sinner. I know I don't deserve salvation. I know I deserve the wrath of God. But, oh, Lord, you are the Savior. You you are merciful. Is it possible? Is it possible that you might save me also? And you just keep uh, and in the meanwhile, because you're serious about this, uh, start reading the Bible so that you get better acquainted with your sin and uh, and Christ as the Savior. And in the meanwhile, you'll also be in an environment where God can save you if indeed that is His plan. But that you can't. There's nothing you can do to guarantee your the fact that you're going to get saved. Uh, there's nothing you can do. Uh, except to wait upon God, wait upon God, and and maybe God will have mercy. And He is a very merciful God. Thank you, Harold Camping. Thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Welcome to Open Forum. Yeah, hello. Hello. Yes, yes go ahead with your call. Yes, uh, I've been struggling with a parable in Second Kings chapter 4. Second Kings chapter four. The first four verses. Second Kings chapter four, the first four verses. There we read. Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead, and thou knowest that thy servant did fear Jehovah. And a creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. And Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in the house? 
And she said, Thine handmaid hath not anything in the house save a pot of oil. Then he said, Go, borrow thee vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels, borrowing not a few. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons, and shalt pour out into all of those vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. So she went from him, shut the door upon her and upon her sons, who brought the vessels to her, and she poured out. And it came to pass, when the vessels were full, that she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more. And the oil stayed and stopped. Then she came and told the man of God. And he said, Go, sell the oil, pay thy debt, and live thou and thy children of the rest. Now what is... Oh, let's pause for this message. We have a caller on the line. What is your question about Second Kings chapter 4? In verse 1, we know that Elijah is a type of Christ. There's a word they say in creditor. Is that the word of God? Uh, it's saying what? In verse 1, it used the word... Oh, and the creditors come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. I I don't know. This is a parable, of course, a historical parable. It's an actual fact of history that this did occur. And uh, I, the vessels, the empty vessels, uh, clay pots or whatever they were, represent the lives of people who are empty without the gospel. The oil represents the gospel. And uh, the fact that... Uh, that uh, uh, the, the, the gospel multiplies as in as we faithfully present the gospel, but now uh, the, the, uh, who the creditor, uh, how that fits in, I don't know. I haven't uh, I haven't looked at this for a long, long time, and so I wouldn't be able to help you. Isn't it amazing how God makes the Bible so difficult? Cause I've been struggling with this for a while now, and it's amazing. Okay, well, well, <laughs> but I'll tell you, what does that do? It keeps us humble, and brother, do we need that all the time. If we could go through the Bible, and every time we look at a page, we can, oh, it all comes, we understand it or perfectly right then and there. My, my, we could be developing an ego that would never stop. But, you know, when you look at a passage and you look at it and read it and read it and pray for wisdom and, and uh, search, uh, uh, church, search the Bible for uh, parallel uh, passages that might help and you can't find an answer, it's a very excellent uh, uh, experience we're going through because it keeps us very humble. It keeps us pleading, Oh, Lord. I don't know anything, Lord, you teach me. And now and then, then a passage does come open and we thank the Lord, recognizing we didn't deserve that. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Mr. Campin. Yes. I just to start off by saying thank you. I know that you've been at this for a while. And the Bible talks a lot about those who stand up for the name of Christ who are persecuted, they are blessed. So, sir, I want to tell you that you are truly blessed because you've been doing this for a number of years, even when people were speaking against you. Uh, you sort of stood up there and hang in there and fought for what you believed in. You put a lot of knowledge and wisdom into a lot of the facts that you've pulled out of the Bible, and a lot of people have a lot to thank you for. And uh, you should be very proud. Um, I want to offer... Well, excuse me. I'm not, that's the last thing I want to hear that I should be very proud. I ought to, uh, because I, how can I take any credit for anything? I'm just a hey there. I'm just another ordinary human being. And why would God, uh, uh, open my eyes when somebody else's eyes have not been open? That's only the mercy of God. But what is your question? Well, sir, actually, I would like to disagree with you. I think that you're a very blessed man have been given the spiritual eyes to be able to see and find what you've been able to find and to share it with so many people. I, I'm sorry, I, what is your question? Uh, on your last call on the empty vessels, I'd like to offer uh, 
an opinion of what that might be. Well, I don't. I, I don't uh, mind admitting I'm, that God has blessed me, and that's God, that gives God all the credit. But He's not blessing me because I deserve it. He is blessing me because of His mercy, of His mercy. And uh, uh, you know, by nature, I'm a sinner like anybody else. I deserve the wrath of God. And why, in fact, any one of us who truly becomes saved, uh, well. Uh, we have experienced the highest blessing of God. Do any of us deserve it? Can any of us say, well, you know, I, 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 I really deserve this in any way, way, in any way? And the answer is absolutely not. Now, will you have a suggestion on Second Kings 4? Yeah, on the empty vessels. You know, everybody has a spirit, a Holy Spirit and soul. And when you become a sinner, your, your, your soul becomes empty. And it's only through the forgiveness of sins that your uh, that your vessels get filled again, and that sort of ties back into fasting. You, know, you don't pour old wine into a new vessel. It's about fasting for forty days, and once you you're rid of sin and rid of rid of Satan and evil, then you refill and refresh the body with a new Holy Spirit and a, and a refreshed soul. Soul. Um, well, wait. Excuse me. We don't fast to get rid of sin. We don't fast to get rid of sin. Fa uh, the fasting has to do with sending out the gospel. Uh, there are people who believe that they have to fast to get rid of sin, but that's not taught in the Bible at all. There's only, in fact, there's only one place where there was a command to fast, and that was on the Day of Atonement. But <laughs> on the Day of Atonement, it isn't people who got rid of sin. It was Christ. Who it was focused there on Christ as the Savior, but in Isaiah 58, fasting is emphasized in connection with sending out the gospel. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes. Hi, Hal uh, Campin. Uh, my name is Gina, and. Um I uh, I pray every day. I try to pray for everybody and um, for my family and for everybody in the world. Um, my question is is that my brother and my sister um, they're in the congregational church and I, I'm trying to get them out of it and I, I don't know what to, what else to do. I just I keep praying for them and they think I'm crazy, you know. And, that, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I, I don't know what to do anymore. Well, now, are you talking about your young children are going to church? No, I'm talking about my siblings, my brother and my sister. Well, it, uh, if you still have authority over them, you can, take, you can tell them, no, you can't go. But then substitute something else. That uh, you're, you're using the word sibling, which is a, uh, a word that has to do with children, but... Uh, are they your brother and... Oh, they're your uh, sibling, I guess, is a brother and sister, aren't they? Yeah, my brother. Uh, and they're... Well, you don't rule over them then, but he, all you can do is pray for them. You know, we all... Hey, there's not one of us. <clears throat> I, I, I don't think there's any human being on the face of the earth who has truly come to become a child of God and has not does not have a very many... Love, beloved uh, relatives, brothers, sisters, parents, children, whatever, who are uh, going and doing something that they think is right and you know is wrong, and they will not listen to you. And what can we do? We we are feel so strongly about it because we just don't want to see uh, them uh, come under the wrath of God. But <clears throat> we have to remember salvation is God's business. He is the one who has to save. And that, of course, gives us hope because while we can't get our children or our parents or whoever it is to go in the direction we'd like to see them go, we can pray, God, God, O oh Lord, have mercy upon my children or upon my brother and sister or whoever. Have mercy, have mercy. And God wants us to do that. We come and pray again and again and again and again. 
and but we have to leave it with the Lord. It may not be they may not be chosen of God, and it's never it isn't even God's intention uh, to that they should come out of the church. And we don't know what God's plan is for uh, for them. I mean, we don't want to cross, try to be smarter than God and tell Him what to do. So we just pray, Oh Lord, if it is Your will, could it be? Could it be? Could it be that uh, that uh, the truth would come to these loved ones of mine? But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to to Open Farm. Good evening, Hermano Camping. Yes. How are you doing? Very well, thank you. My name is Eduardo Husino, and I'm calling from Horsham, Pennsylvania. And I want to share with you and all the people that are listening two pieces of history of new discovery information that has not been revealed to people for two millenniums. And my first study of the Bible is what happened in the Garden of Gethsemane after the Last Supper. And well, I want what, to read me, this the is, end of chapter 14. Uh, excuse me, excuse me. This huh? is a program where we want to start out with your question. Uh, and then, based on what your question is asking, we'll get into the topic that has to be discussed. But what is your question? Can you read John 14? What is your question? My question is, can... From chapter 15, 1 to chapter 16, 15, can it be the prince of the world speaking, not other than Satan? From John 15, 1. Well, let's, uh, let's look at that a moment. John 15, 1. I am the true vine, and my father is a husband, man. To John 16:15, where we're reading, All things that the Father hath are mine, therefore said I that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. Now, what is your question about this? More than 42 passage? verses yeah. is not Jesus Christ talking. Is the priest of the world called Satan that you will find in the end of chapter 14, uh, verse 30 and 31st? Can you read that, please? John 14, Hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me, but that the world may know that I love the Father, as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. Arise, let us go hence. Now, what what are you saying about Satan in chapter 15? Okay. This This part of the Bible, I know because it's been unveiled to me by the Holy Spirit, that is the temptation of the apostles by Satan himself. From chapter 15, 1 to chapter 16, 15. And I have the, my study and the proof of the Bible, scripture by scripture, verse by verse, of now, this story. Excuse me, excuse me. That may be your private uh, understanding, and you're entitled to know what you want, but that's not what this word is talking about. These are the words of the Lord Jesus. Uh, it's uh, it, Chapter 15 doesn't tie in with the last verse of the last two verses of chapter 14. Uh, that That is simply indicating the timing of when this is happening that it's he, Christ is getting ready to go to the cross to demonstrate how he suffered. But Satan does not appear in his, in his chapter uh, 15 it's uh, 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 or 16 the first 15 verses uh, well, uh, 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 so thank you so much for calling and you, sharing you, Brother Camping, yeah. you know what's happening over here that when you take away or you put to the words of the scripture just like the end of the bible says well maybe that's what your judgment is and uh, that's you're what's happening in these chapters it. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. <clears throat> Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Mr. Kevin. Yes. Mr. Hawkins, Albert Hawkins. I've been trying to get through to you, but uh, it takes a while to get through to you, you know. So uh, I finally caught you. 
Uh, I want to ask you about uh, the verse in uh, Psalms 89. It says, uh, Blessed is the people that know the joyful sound. They shall walk, O Lord, in the light of thy contentions. Uh, what 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 is it saying? Uh, what Psalm eighty nine. What the joyful sound be? The joyful sound. That's Psalm eighty nine, and which verse? Uh, hmm. Uh, well, I don't have the verse, but the, the joyful sound, and that is a true biblical statement. Uh, the joyful sound is the sound of the gospel, the sound of the true gospel. Uh, and, and, and we know that joyful sound only if we have become saved. Then we, it's all joy for our lives because it's coming, it's, it's words that come from the mouth of God. And we rejoice to be able to hear from Him. Can anything be more wonderful in our lives? than to hear right from the mouth of God his uh, teachings that he wants us to know about. Okay. But that's uh, in, in verse 15. Uh, let me see. Let us be glad according to the days when... No. Uh, no oh, wait a minute. I'm in the wrong chapter. Verse 15. Blessed is the people that know the joyful sound. They shall walk, O Jehovah, in the light of thy countenance. That is, if we know the Word of God, we are trusting in the Word of God because God has saved us, then we walk in a way that is pleasing to God. Mm -hmm. I have another question. Yes. Uh, let me ask you this one. Uh, what is this great music that I know you don't know I'm hearing it. I, I hear it all the time, and I wake up, and I hear it, and I work, hear it Every day, all day. I but, don't. I don't. And it's beautiful music, like voice. I mean, like organ, and the sound coming from an organ playing. And sometimes there'll be uh, voices, and I can't make it out what they're saying. But it sounds beautiful, Mr. Camping. Well, let me say this: it does not come from God. That we know. The God is not. The only way we're going to hear from Him is through His Word. But the, on the other hand, we're very, our minds are very complex. And, uh, you know, sometimes our subconscious mind will, will be dealing with us so that, uh, yes, I, I too have had that experience where, where I really thought I was hearing somebody playing music in my ears and yet I wasn't around anybody playing music, but it comes out of our own subconsciousness and, that's something that uh, I don't understand how that all works, but that can be so. It's just uh, like when we dream. It, uh, the dreams are very real, uh, but it's not because someone, some outward source is, is uh, giving us information. It just comes right out of our own subconsciousness. Mm -hmm. But I'm here to now, and, and it's going on. Well, I'm, I'm, like I say, uh, I... I I can't tell you how our minds work, but our minds are very complex, and and our subconscious mind can get into our conscious mind. But thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Mr. Camping. Yes. Uh, Revelations chapter 7, verse 4. Um, what are they referring who are they... Who is God referring to the 144,000? Revelation 7, verse 4, And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Now, this is referring to all of those who became saved during the 1955-year period of the church age. They are typified by... Uh, the, the names of 12 of the tribes, it says all of the tribes, but actually all of the tribes are named here because it is, they're only, these tribes of Israel are looked upon spiritually. They refer to those who have had identification with the kingdom of God. 
and 12,000 out of each tribe. It's the complete fullness. It's not giving us a, an actual number. It's a complete fullness of all those who have become saved during the church age. Now notice in verse 1. After these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And, uh, 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 in verse 3, they were told, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And then there were 144,000 sealed. Now, uh, the great tribulation is when the four winds uh, began, that is, God began to uh, bring judgment. And that could not begin until he had completed whatever work he had planned for the church age. Uh, that is, that the complete fullness, the 144,000, a thousand is complete, 12 times 12 is fullness, the complete fullness of all those who were to become saved through the church age had been completed. Then he's finished with that. He's not going to use the churches anymore to save anybody else. And now he is going to begin the period of great tribulation, a final 23-year period or 8,400-day period uh, during which he's going to still save a great multitude, but it'll be outside of the churches altogether. And in the meanwhile, judgment is coming on the churches uh, 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 as, as they are being prepared for their turn at the judgment throne of God or at the uh, c coming into the judgment day of God. I have one other question. Yeah. If you would mind, cha uh, Revelation chapter 6, verse 9. Revelation 6, verse 9, there we read, And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud, cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them, that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Now here God is giving us a spiritual truth that of course the desire of the true believers, especially once we have died and we're with Christ in heaven, uh, we're under the blood of Christ, that means to be under the altar, that uh, is we are saved by what Christ has done for us, and we long for a completion of our salvation when we can have our resurrected bodies and we can be as a whole personality with Christ forevermore. And God says, no, you can't have that. You can't have that. Uh, uh, and, of course, when we receive our resurrected bodies, that's when justice will be uh, will have been completed, when, when uh, we uh, are... Uh, when God's wrath is, is finally coming on the unsaved of the world, God says, no, you have to wait, you have to wait, you have to exist in your soul existence, in other words, uh, for a little while until, until uh, at the end, when, uh, then when I am ready to complete the salvation of everybody that I plan to save. But thank you, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Oh, hello. Thank you. Um, my name is Malachi. Yes. Um, I visited a friend's church, and they believe in the gift of tongues. Is that true? That the gift, the, those who believe in the gift of tongues are absolutely have set up a false gospel in which Satan rules because God declares in when he finished the Bible back 1900 years ago, he said in Revelation 22, verse 18, If anyone adds to the words of this prophecy, I will add to him the, or this book, I will add to him the plagues written herein. And this is what they have done. They believe that when, when uh, they speak in tongues, this is a message that they receive from the Holy Spirit in an unknown language. 
and uh, and there are others in the congregation who think they can interpret and so that it becomes a message from God to the whole congregation. And the same people also are very interested in receiving messages and dreams and visions and, and hearing voices. And all of this is in direct rebellion against God. And it actually indicates that Satan is ruling there, even though even though this all began years and years before God actually uh, uh, officially put Satan in the churches to rule, already in the charismatic churches where this has been going on and some other denominations too for other reasons, uh, Satan already was ruling. Okay, I have one more question. Yes. Is it, is it a sin to drink alcohol? Uh, the Bible, uh, read, just read Proverbs 31. It's not for kings to desire drink, uh, wine or strong drink, uh, because, and every true believer is a king. And uh, you see, the world wants alcohol because God has given that as a blessing. A fine glass of wine uh, for dinner, along with dinner, can make the dinner more uh, palatable. It, the alcohol relieves our tensions somewhat, and so it is a blessing to natural man. But the true believer has a better, a better answer. Uh, we read in Philippians chapter four: "You don't be anxious," and that's what, that's where alcohol comes in. People are. In, in, in anxiety of one kind or another, and the alcohol helps to calm their nerves. And and, uh, and as long as they stick with the one glass, it's fine. But unfortunately, they also sometimes lose their 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 judgment. And the next thing, it's a second and a third glass, and the next thing, they're drunk, and then it's a horrible thing. But the fact is that a true believer has a much better answer. We read in Philippians chapter 4, don't be anxious about anything. In the Old English, it's don't be careful. That's an Old English word for anxious. Don't be anxious about anything, but with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your requests known to the Lord. And the peace of God that passeth understanding will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus that by all odds is a far better solution to anxiety than a glass of the finest wine. But thank you. Sure. God bless. Thank you for calling and sharing. And now we have come to the end of our time. My time flies by as we get into these questions in the Word of God. But, boy, it is a pleasure to have the Bible to give us answers because when we get an answer correctly from the Bible, then we know we have wisdom. Then we know we have truth. And that's hard to find in these days when when uh, there's all kinds of self-serving and people are doing it for their... Uh, for their uh, uh, sp- acting, speaking like they do know and they don't know. Until our next open forum, may the Lord richly bless you. Good night.